What's up, everybody? Welcome to Show Me the Meaning, Wisecracks Movie Podcast. Show me the meaning! My name is Jared, and I'm joined here with the original Show Me the Meaning crew. We got Austin. Yo! And we got Ryan. And we got Ryan. <laughs> Did we lose Ryan? Oh, that was quick. <laughs> Oh, I think we lost Ryan. Hold on. We lost Ryan. All right. Hold on one second. Fucking people are like, technology's going to save the world, bro. I'm like, yeah, well, then how come it makes me so goddamn stressed out? <laughs> I'm so sorry. I pressed the wrong button. Okay. Let's try this again. Welcome, Welcome back. back. Let's try this again. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. And we got Ryan. Hey, film fans, what's up? There we go. All right, guys, today we're covering Roma, the 2018 film directed by Alfonso Cuaron, starring Yelitsa Arapicio. I hope I'm getting that right. As always, let's start with some first impressions. Since I already know what Austin thinks about this movie, let's start with Ryan. Ryan, what was it like watching <laughs> this movie? I mean, if you have seen it twice, uh, first time and revisiting it for this podcast, but, you know, give us the lowdown. What do you think? Man, I'm so glad you asked that question, Jared. This is my number one favorite movie of 2018, wow. which I'm sure a lot of people out there agree with, because it is the best one. There's no doubt about it. It's just, um, what uh, what is there not to say about this movie? It's a slice of life from Alfonso Cuaron, who really uh, gives it to us every time. It's the most like his movie, like if you've ever seen his movie, uh, uh, E Tu Mama Tambien, I think it's the most content and it's kind of stylistically like that movie. It's very long takes, and you're kind of just getting to know these characters for two and a half hours. My my one, um, my yeah. So it's a beautiful movie, and I have a lot to say about it. I'm excited we're talking about it. Uh, uh, my one criticism, a little too long, probably about 25, 30 minutes. You could take out of this movie easy, but hey, who cares? It, it, it's a it's a fucking masterpiece. Um, the the all props to Cleo, the uh, uh, or the the. The person who plays Cleo, you know, a brand new actress, she knocks it out of the park. And yeah, there's just, this movie's amazing. What do you got to say? I got to say rock and roll. Let's hear from Austin. Austin, let's hear it. Well, the reason that Jared said he already knows what I think is because I messaged him earlier this week and <laughs> I said, I don't just love this movie. I am in love with this movie. I am infatuated with this movie. As a matter of fact, it was Ryan that recommended that I see this movie. I don't know if you remember that, Ryan, but we were recording. Oh, yeah. And I, yeah, and I said, I hadn't seen it. And you said, you got to see it. It's going to be the best picture. And I'd heard about it a little bit. And, you know, I like Alfonso Cuaron, obviously. But uh, it was you that said you got to go see it. And you, you both, I think, said I had to see it in the theater. So I made sure that I was able to find a theater near me that had a limited release, a limited screening. And I went to this you know, independent cinema house and I watched it. And that was, you know, over a month ago now. And it has stuck with me more profoundly than any other film that I've seen, I'd say, in the last handful of years. And there are a couple of reasons why, and we'll probably get into that later, but it was also just like a confluence of things that were going on in my life at the same time that really kind of made this film speak to me. But I will say this, just because I want to say it, because sometimes we'll see a film and then we'll rewatch it, but I intentionally did not rewatch it because mm. I don't want to ruin how amazing that experience of watching it the first time was. And that's kind of what I mean when I say I'm in love with it. Like, you know when you're infatuated with a person, that whole like love at first sight thing? Like, that's how... I don't even want to ruin the beauty of that. So I, I'm going to wait a very long time before I watch this on Netflix. <laughs> yeah, I respect that. There are a couple of movies that I've only seen once because they worked on me so well. Like, have you ever seen the movie The Place Beyond the Pines? Oh, yeah. Uh, I have. I didn't really like that movie. See, I don't think I would like it again if I rewatched it. But for some reason, maybe it was the meal I just ate. Maybe it was the theater experience. Maybe it was the company I was with. But that yep. movie grabbed me. And I don't think it'll ever happen again. So I've only seen it that one time and I will never rewatch it. Or at least I don't plan on rewatching you know, it. I had that experience with like a, a film that I, I know for a fact if I watched again, it won't have the same impact. It's called Smashed. And mm. uh, it's this little independent film with uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead and Aaron Paul. And it had this profound impact on me. It's about like these two alcoholics and some shit that they're going through. And it just had this really profound impact on me. And I know if I saw it again, I'd be like, yeah, okay, it's a decent movie. But it... In my mind, it was like it rocked my world. And I think sometimes that's a good thing to experience a piece of art and not have to like re-commodify it on subsequent viewings, you know? 
definitely. Uh, yeah, I, 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 uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Austin, about the theater thing, because I, I kind of needed to elaborate on my intro a little bit, because I did, I, I saw it in the theater the first time when it was in its original release here, and then I also just rewatched it for the podcast on my home uh, TV, and I've never seen a movie like this where, where I, it, because I, before I watched this on my on, on Netflix, I recommended it to a whole so many people like I did to you, and a whole bunch of people watched it obviously on Netflix just because it's way easier. And I got a lot of people going, I don't know, man, you kind of hyped that movie up a lot. And then the few people that <laughs> right. did go out and see it at the movie theater were like, holy fucking shit! I cannot believe what I just watched. That was so amazing, because it really is, and and. and and then people will say, "Well, shit, you, you know, does a movie a movie doesn't ju- shouldn't just have to be good just if you see the movie theater?" But I gotta say, this is an experience. This is like a black and white sixty five millimeter roller coaster ride. That's the slowest roller coaster ride you've ever been on <laughs> with a ten minute mopping scene. But god damn it, if you stick it out in the movie theater, it works. But if you have your fucking yeah. phone uh, around you and you know you're five minutes yes. in the mopping scene i'm sorry but you're gonna be wondering you know you don't want to check instagram it's not gonna it's not gonna have the same effect go see this movie in a movie theater well guys yeah. i uh, hate to break it to you but i did not watch this movie in a movie theater okay. did you still, what, what were you so you here's the thing though i i i saw this movie for the first time yesterday and I delayed watching it because I wanted to follow the advice that you guys are giving me and see it in a movie theater. But then I thought to myself, do I really want to spend the money? I mean, I'll be honest. That was my first thought. But then I was thinking, usually oh God. usually when I make the decision to see a movie in the theater or I'm a movie theater purist, it's because I contend that this movie was meant to be seen in the theater. But can you really say that about this movie? It's certainly perhaps optimized for the theater, and I know I'm being just kind of like a cheap bastard here, but I was like, you know what? This movie was only greenlit because it was Netflix. It was paid for by Netflix, and this is the new future of films like this getting made. So if it doesn't work on this screen, then we're in trouble. And so I wanted to experience it for the first time on Netflix, and I like the movie. I'm going to be honest. I don't think I had quite the transformative experience you guys did. Perhaps it was because both... (laughs) Both Austin and Michael Burns, Austin's old roommate who uh, sometimes is on the Squanch podcast, I mean, you guys hyped it up crazy. I mean, you guys were talking about, like, using language to think it was, like, the best movie ever. I liked it. It honestly reminded me a lot of a, a lot of Fellini movies that I saw when I was in high school. This one probably just made a little bit m- more sense. Um, but I, especially toward the second half of the movie, once uh, the impregnation scene and the beach scene I started to get really really sucked in and I'll Mm. admit I probably would have had a better experience if I were in the theater but I don't want to give the impression that I don't like the movie I think the movie is great you mean the the abortion scene or the 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 birth scene yes the birth scene yeah yeah, yeah. the birth scene not the abortion scene (laughs) honestly this is drastically I'm sorry is that what I said did I say did did I say abortion you said the you said the pregnancy scene, and then it oh, made preg- me think okay. of oh, you know okay. this, this the, the the like the naked dude with the pole dancing around and doing his karate his martial arts shit, and then I and then I, I remembered what you're talking about because it's the tension of that scene and the beach scene that are like you like hold your breath. It was like the opening of Gravity where you're holding your breath for like the first nine minutes of that movie. Like I didn't breathe during the beach scene, and then during the the birth scene again, same sort of thing. I was like that whole those two sequences. I I don't think I breathed. <laughs> You yeah, know? I'm glad you brought that up because another thing about Alfonso Cuaron is that I like all of his movies, but every single one of them I think other people generally like more than I do. So, for example, like I know Ryan swears by Gravity; it's one of his favorite movies of all time. To me, it's a it's a good thriller. Am I wrong, Ryan? No, yeah, uh, you're right. But I, I can see people, you know, not loving Gravity as you know as much. I mean, it, I, I fully admit it's very light on story or whatnot. I just thought the special effects were so groundbreaking and amazing. That's all, you know. Right. Uh, same with Children yeah. of Men. I like the movie. I would even say I like it a lot, but I'm not in love with it. I don't really think that a lot of the fancy camera work is much more than just cool. Uh, but I think I'm in the minority there. Anyway, I really like this movie. I probably should have seen it in a theater. But, I mean, I mean, can we just take a second? It's like, what does that mean if we see a movie that's probably going to win Best Picture that really only works in a theater but is being basically 
promoted and promoted by Netflix, paid for by Netflix, and more or less they want you to see it on their platform because it's going to make you subscribe and get more subscribers. I mean, what are we supposed to think about that? I mean, it is crazy. You're right. Alfonso Cuaron, though, will tell you that the best way to see this movie is in the movie theater, you know? So he's not saying go watch it on Netflix. Netflix obviously wants you to watch it on Netflix. Um, but yeah, like like what it says is, it, I think the best point made is by the Netflix people when they say like, think about your favorite movies you've ever seen. Did you watch them in the movie theater? Probably not. You saw probably saw them on video, like The Godfather. I don't, you know, I watched them on tape. Whatever. Yeah. Like like like. So they want to be in the business of making the best movies, but obviously everyone but also giving what the customers want, which is convenience, unfortunately. But, you know, if the theatrical experience is there for the people who want to see it, you know, they're, uh, yeah. But this particular movie is strange in that way, that it really does play so much better in the theater. It's insane. Jared, you really just proved my point on how much, you know, like you kind of like, yeah, I don't know. Like uh, uh, you would have loved it more in the theater. And I know. I yeah, I, I, I believe you. I, I, think, I believe you 100%. I think, Ryan hit the, I, th- I think Ryan hit the nail on the head. Because this is a slow film, it's about the attention. If your attention is not focused on this film as much as entirely possible, you know, you can never say 100%. Something is always going to snap you out of it. But as much as possible, if you can have a meditative experience with this type of film, and I think with most cinema, it truly enhances or enriches your experience. If you can get that watching it on Netflix at home, you can have a similar immersive experience. If you can have that watching it on a big screen TV or a laptop or on your iPhone or whatever digital device you're using, then you can have that experience. The problem is, is when you're watching it on your phone, a message comes in. Or when you're watching it on your laptop, bing, or your roommate, or something's going on. So it's it's more difficult to have that immersive experience. I think that's the issue. I don't ever fuck with mov- watching movies on my phone. That is not something that I do. I mean, I, I have a TV. You know, the room is dark. I try to make it as quiet as possible, but I get the message. Anyway, yeah. let's go into a recap. Cleo is a live-in domestic worker for an upper-middle-class family in 1970s Mexico. After briefly dating a young martial artist named Fermin, she gets pregnant and is abandoned by him. She witnesses the patriarch of the household, Antonio, running off with another woman, while the matriarch, Sofia, flirts with the idea of an extramarital affair, but ultimately does not pursue one. Cleo travels outside the city to confront Fermin, but he rejects her again. Meanwhile, after months of absence, Sofia discovers that Antonio has abandoned their family for another woman. On the way to buy a crib for the baby, Cleo finds herself in the middle of the 1971 Corpus Christi massacre and goes into labor, but the baby does not survive. Cleo goes with the family on a vacation to the beach, and Sophia tells the family that Antonio will not be coming back. Two of the kids almost drown in the ocean, but Cleo saves them, and she admits that she never wanted the baby to be born. Back at home, the family gets accustomed to their new living situation, and Cleo says she had a great time at the beach. End of movie. Hmm. All right, guys. Before we go on, I want to give a shout-out to our sponsors over at Twillery. So Twillery, uh, they sell shirts, shirts that are super comfortable, super soft. I'm holding one in my hand right now. They look good. It's easy to care for. They fit perfectly, and uh, you're not going to feel like a gross slob in them because the— because the fabric breathes and it's actually actually quite nice. Even when I'm holding it right now, it actually feels cool to the touch. And it gets kind of hot in this podcast room, so I'm a bit impressed. Kind of making me want to put it on right now. Anyway, uh, Twillery is dress shirts that look good. They're slimming. You can wear them tucked or untucked. Always free shipping in the U.S. and free returns. You can save more money if you buy more shirts. Right now, Twillery is giving Show Me the Meaning listeners $25 off their first show. Tro- their first shirt order by going to twillery.com slash show me and entering the promo code show me at checkout. So guys, if you want to look fly, you want to look fresh, I highly recommend Twillery. They are friends of the podcast. They support us and supporting them is supporting us. So thank you guys at Twillery. Strip, Jared, strip. Give the people what they want. (laughs) Oh, is that? (laughs) Yeah, not going to happen. I promise it's disappointing. Um, what? Oh. <laughs> phone sound effect. Uh, all right. So I mentioned earlier that I think that this movie, I don't know if this has been written anywhere or if anybody else has brought this up, but um, there's got he's got to be consciously uh, evoking Fellini here. I mean, the whole movie feels like La, Jol- La Dolce Vita. The scene where they're stuck in the traffic while Cleo is in labor reminds me a lot of the opening of Eight and a Half. Ryan, did you get this at all? No, not really. I, I, to me, Alfonso Cuaron has really mastered his pretty a very unique style. Like, like it, I, I don't 
feel like it's really evocative of much of anything besides himself at this point. Like, like, like you were saying, like the 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 really sl- uh, long shots didn't really work for you, but I don't know. They really worked for me. They they. Oh uh, no no no! I I, I was uh, I was talking about in uh, Children of Men, not this movie. They work for me in this movie. Oh, okay, cool. But yeah, like, like, I, I feel like this camera works very like objective. Whenever you know, the, like, just the pans across her house and stuff, and then mixing that with just kind of his very, you know, little slight, like the little tiny slices of life, like them on top of the house, like daydreaming and stuff. Like, I don't know. You, it feels more natural than a Fellini movie to me. But, uh, but yeah, I guess because it's in black and white, it also feels like a Fellini movie. I don't know. Um, yeah, so. I guess maybe like early Fellini when it's more like the Italian neorealism when we have like yes, uh, that's La, what I was gonna say. Like it's, La Strada, like eight and a yeah. half is more surreal, right. whereas like La Dolce Vita and earlier stuff has more of that the neorealist. Whereas for me, this film was very grounded in a realism that wasn't yeah. quite, there, you know. So the, it was much more of like a, a neorealist interpretation, let's say, of like Fellini. But I, I mean. How can we say it's not inspired by Fellini? Quran is clearly a cinephile, so I'm sure that that his specter hovers over Quran's work, you know? Sure. All right, guys, let's start off talking about the political context of this movie. Um, I read a really great article in Time magazine called Real History of Roma by Alejandro de la Garza. And uh, so throughout the movie, there are events going on in the background, whether it's the aforementioned Corpus Christi massacre that happens while she's buying a crib, or there's various proclamations on the radio that are uh, talking about how a particular president has been brought into office. There are marches in the streets. So um, basically, uh, according to this article, since, since I know nothing about Mexican history, I had to look it up. Uh, since 1929, Mexico's government was dominated by the Institutional Revolution Party. And at this time, in the 70s, uh, resistance to this government was reaching a boiling point. So the Inter-Institutional Revolution Party, or the PRI, was responsible for what is called the Dirty War, in which they committed horrible atrocities to squash any attempts of rebellion, especially in the rural areas where they could do all sorts of horrible stuff um, without anyone really even reporting on it. Um so in 1968, a lot of youth movements broke out in the United States around in the United States and around the world. And Mexico City experienced a summer of street protests against government repression. And you can see a little bit of this. Um, there are campaign posters and signs for the PRI in several scenes. And then in the crib scene where she goes into labor on June 10th, 1971, a crowd of protesting students was attacked by the Halcones, or Falcons, which were a group of young government-trained paramilitaries intended to pass as a rival student faction. They were armed with knives and bamboo sticks, and they killed dozens of demonstrators, and the clash sent shockwaves through the country. It wasn't until 2000 that the PRI would be ousted, and um, so that's kind of some context to that, which I think is... Um, I would say in general, a lot of the important things going on in this movie are things that are in the background, not only socially in the background, but just literally in the frame, things going on in the background. Um, The only other piece of context I want to bring up is that Cleo is an indigenous person and that like land shortages, in addition to the regime's policy of keeping corn prices artificially low to promote industrialization, this is a direct uh, quote from De La Garza, forced massive migrations of poor indigenous populations both to the United States and larger cities in Mexico to become these live-in house um, housemaids. So I think that we're seeing all sorts of different reflections of the social climate of the 70s, which I guess is when Cuaron grew up in Mexico city. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think if you were to ask, go, go ahead, Ryan. Uh, well, yeah, I I, I was just gonna say, we we really haven't talked about how this is a very autobiographical film for Quran, you know, and that he's supposed to be one of these kids that are, that are, you know, kind of represented and that he really had a nanny that was, you know, that Cleo represents. And, uh, so yeah, uh, continue the film tour at the end. Right. Well, hold on. Yeah, that is, yeah. Is Quaron's past, is it this middle-class family of this movie, or is it the elite upper-class family of Itumama Tambien? He, he, no, it's this movie. It's the 
it's the i mean the, 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 they're pretty upper class in this film i mean middle upper class but like yeah like he was one of the wealthier kids in his town i'm pretty i i think uh is is his biography and itumama tambien i thought they were like elite elites which is what i assumed was his background because that movie felt very personal as well but it was also later in his life like i think that that was yeah maybe they i see i don't know got more money i don't know i see what were you going to say, yeah, Austin? I was going to say, I think, yeah, I think that, it, you know how you said that, like, both were raving about this film. And I think one of the reasons was the political backdrop that you just alluded to that made the film so rich for me. Because, so, Cleo is of Mixteca background, which is, I believe, from the region of Oaxaca in Mexico, which has been a, a site of indigenous struggles against the Mexican government for a very long time. So, in particular, what you see in the background, and I think there are a few huge themes that make this film so rich to me. One is like gender roles, difference between, you know, a sort of type of masculinity uh, and how the men are portrayed. And then, of course, uh, sort of like a feminine desire. What is the feminine role and a sort of like type of portrayal of a, a feminine, uh, let's say, stereotype or caricature within a certain society. But then all of that, I think, also relates to the issue of the economic division or the class division that you get that is so important. And one of the things that's so important for understanding class is the idea of expropriation of land, right, which is like the taking of land. So there's a shortage of land, but it's not because of like natural causes or something like that. But it's because the government was literally expropriating this land from indigenous peoples and then kicking them off of their land. So, you know, there are all these scenes where there's this one scene where in the, they're in this bar, you know, when they go off for the holidays mm -hmm. and uh, they kind of sneak off. And then they're in this bar with all the other like caretakers and the workers and stuff in the area when they're at like the, the, the wealthiest people's home, which is funny, too, because remember the wealthy people when they're shooting the guns and stuff like that, they're joking around about like the communist revolution and expropriating land and stuff like that. So this isn't like me reading into this film. Quran is clearly channeling some sort of like class struggle here. But uh, there's this bit where they're in this bar during that kind of sequence where someone mentions to Cleo that, oh, that guy over there, his, he's, he was a farmer, but his land was stolen from him. There uh, is another bit during that sequence where, you know, and, like, the, they killed fire his fire actually was caused in the fields. What's up? And like they killed his dog? Yeah, they killed his dog. Fuck um, that. Right. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> No, no violence to animals. Um, and there's another bit in the fields where they've got like these, uh, I think they've got like these crosses set up so that people were killed again because of these struggles over land. So you have this, this issue of like geography where land is literally being taken from indigenous peoples and it's being acquired by the government and then of course sold off to privatization. And so that's something that takes place in the background that I think we can't ignore, that, that makes this film, it sets the frame of this film almost as like the mise-en-scene that we cannot ignore because it, it governs everything else. So you can't understand her role in the middle class or upper middle class family without understanding how she was displaced from her land. And then that, that affects how it is that she's kind of displaced in her own culture, in her own society, because she's... She's part of it, but also not part of it. And then in the family, she's displaced. She's part of the family, but she's also not part of the family. You now, in the issue of, and I think we see this unfold until the very end, is what is her role? Is she just a servant, or is she? If they love her and they take care of her, but there's still that tension where she both is, but because of this place uh, under the, the the idea of the enclosure logic that is taking place under. Uh, under this particular historical regime of capitalism in Mexico. So I want to talk about uh, talk about that in context of some of the formal elements of this movie. So one thing I found particularly interesting was that there's a lot of deep focus going on in this movie, which essentially just means that there's a very long depth of field. Usually when... Usually, in with most cinematography, people aspire to have a shallow depth of field, which basically means that everything in the background is blurry, some things in the foreground are blurry, and the only thing that's in focus is the subject of the frame. But in this movie, almost always, we see everything in focus. So we see Cleo working on the house in the foreground, and then all the way in the background, outside the window, there's the dog taking a shit on the driveway or something like that, and it's all in focus, which is something that's actually quite rare. Uh, the other time that's that is done and which is quite famous is in Citizen Kane. Uh, Wells' cinematographer Greg Toland very famously used deep focus, and uh, even that was pretty revolutionary for the time. So, and interestingly, this use of deep focus is written about a lot, and 
Now, people usually break it down for it meaning different, something different from scene to scene. But so, for example, at the beginning of Citizen Kane, we see a bunch of lawyers determining the future of young Charlie's life. And he's in the background in a, in a shot that's actually very similar to the ones that we see in this movie, because we see in a wide shot all these men talking about Charlie's future in the foreground. And then in the background, through the window, we see Charlie playing with his sled in the background. And I think this is meant to suggest that these men's banter is going to profoundly affect this child in the background. It's kind of this cause and effect relationship, whereas these men are just kind of bickering about money. There's this kind of, I guess you could say, this victim in the background that is whose life is going to be changed profoundly by the bickering of these lawyers. And so I wanted to hear your guys' thoughts as to why you think that Quaron wanted to use deep focus for this movie. And does it have anything to do with the political background that you just mentioned, Austin? <laughs> I, um, yeah, I, I, what do you think? I, well, yeah, for one, I totally agree. Um, and I love the deep focus thing. You don't see Fellini using that shit. I'm telling you, Corone. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's the same baby. thing. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, but the reason I think he did it is because he really, you know, to bring out, for what, like we said before, he, he shot at 65 millimeter. He, he really is going for that crisp detail, baby. You know, like, like for one, another big detail of the production of this shoot is that they, he literally got, he recreated his apartment from his childhood, like with literally the same decor, like from when he grew up. And I think he wanted that in focus and he wanted it, uh, uh, all these details, um, like the car, for instance, you know, like he went through great, painstaking detail obviously to make uh, uh, every uh, part of the motions of those cars and every of the fabric the texture of the car very you know to stand out to pop on screen and that was mm -hmm. on purpose because he he wants you to kind of bring you back to people who had that car like I, my grandpa had one of those cars you know hmm. like uh, uh so he's really putting you in that place in the 70s and then i totally agree with everything you said about just the background i love the fact that they don't really comment they don't talk about what's going on in the background but it's obviously obviously affecting her life in such a big way and yeah what i took from it is there's just that it's kind of like what you're saying her relationship to it it, you know, her day to day life is just waking up and 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 taking care of these these other people's kids, and she and almost the form of the movie to me is saying that she doesn't have either time to talk about that stuff, or that maybe we're not just seeing it, but that, yeah, it's just not as important as the rest of her day, as the mop, as the ten minutes of fucking mopping that we see. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how I took that uh, 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 that stuff. I love it. Hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it is genius at a couple of different levels. I think in one sense, we've kind of alluded to the fact that this film is relatively slow. And I think one of the things that can really benefit a film that is slow is if the frame is richer, right? Like, can you imagine, for example, the Bourne identity using deep focus? No, because there's like a cut every three oh, seconds. No. You can't fucking, Paul Greengrass can't do that with, whatever the captain captain phillips you can't do that because the camera's moving so erratically and it's cutting all the time so you don't have enough time to be able to take in everything that's going on the frame all you have time to do is experience as jared just said the subject there's something very very particular and very limited that the director wants you to look at and usually in american cinema in particular they want you to focus on the person because we are individually driven, which is fine, whatever. I mean, this is one of the things that like Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir loved about American cinema as opposed to uh, like the French avant-garde cinema uh, in the 30s and 40s, for example, is that American cinema has like huge individuals, like superheroes, right? And they're existentialists. So they love that. That's one of the things that American cinema is about. It's about the individual and the subject. But slow cinema really does benefit from a deep focus because or let's say the other way around, deep focus really benefits from a slower pace even because it allows you to look at the background. So one of my favorite film directors is Bellatar, and he's known for making very slow films. Um, Satan Tango is like seven hours long, but my favorite film <laughs> of his is the Turin, the Turin Horse, and the Turin Horse is this magnificent piece of slow cinema that allows you to just look at the frame and sit there. And it's not action-driven, and it's not plot-heavy, and there is there, there is no three-act structure. I mean, maybe you could divide it up into three parts if you really forced it, but it's not the typical way that we think of cinema. 
But nevertheless, it allows you to just sit there and be immersed into this frame and look at everything. You don't have to just simply look at what is most immediate in front of us. And I think what Quaran is doing in this film, uh, beyond just the fact of like the formal or the story, or the the story level or like the narrative level, is at the conceptual level. Is he's trying to say, it's our context and our backgrounds and the structure of our lives that affect us, and it's not just about us and our choices and what we do. And so for Cleo, it's not just about her, it's everything around her that is dictating the conditions of her life. It's everything around her that is conditioning her so that she can move the way that she moves, but only within those parameters that have been structured prior to her being thrown into those. The land expropriation, her having to work, the dog shitting in the background all over the place. You know, those things condition what she's able to do and how she's able to live. So part of the film then has to reconcile so then how is she supposed to have agency as a subject within the context and the background and the structure of the world that affects us and that's the thing that i think quran could really be exploring in this is how do we understand then what it means to be a subject when we also recognize how over determined we might be by the background that is impinging upon us yeah i agree with definitely that last part it's interesting that you mention how deep focus can be utilized to tell a story that doesn't focus so much on the individual. Because when you think about movies that focus on the individual, Citizen Kane is the ultimate movie about the individual. Hmm. Not that I'm saying... I mean, they can, yeah, use, yeah. they can use the same formal function for different purposes, obviously. Uh, but no, I think you're probably right. I think that... Uh, coupled with the political context that you mentioned earlier, as well as what I want to talk about next is just the fact that, and, and this largely is connected with the deep focus thing, but just the fact that there's always something going on in the background. The background is always busy. Specifically, there's a plane while the martial arts guru is balancing blindfolded. There are people playing soccer in the background. And then when the film ends, we see that plane cross the frame again in the sky. Well, we see it at the, at the beginning, too. Oh, when, do we? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's reflected in the water on the ground uh, as the camera. So the camera's like focused on the ground, and then you hear it, and then I think you see it in the reflection on the water, and it almost starts. It looks like the film is bookended, and constantly it's this motif. And I was actually going to ask you guys what you thought it meant. Was it like signaling how people were leaving Mexico? Was it signaling displacement, how you're always in transit? What's going on? Hmm. Well, for one, I think that was probably while Jared was surfing on his phone, he missed that part. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Maybe it was because um, I was taking then, notes, Ryan. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, but yeah, I, 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 the, the, what I got or what I got out of it was just it was you know Cleo's there mopping. You know she's uh, she's in this kind of grimy uh, floor, and then there's people going God knows where on Earth uh, that she's not a part of. It's just kind of the it's just kind of a very mm. simple, n nice little class motif. That uh, yes. uh, uh, and, it's, yeah. uh, and it's a reflection too. It's not even like you're not even actually seeing it. You're just seeing like oh, uh, you know, a reflection of it. So that's what I got out of it. Mm. You know, hearing like you, that. hearing you guys talk about how personal this film is for Quaron, which I didn't know before I watched it. I'm wondering if you think this has anything to do with like it's almost his symbolic guilt for leaving or something like that. I definitely, I mean, he, he's talked about in interviews about it. Like, like there's definitely a guilt aspect to the movie. Like. You know, uh, uh, I think this is kind of, yeah, his his not reckoning, but just kind of like, like, all right, you know, I really want to get into uh, her, uh, uh, my, my nanny's point of view from when I was growing up, because it was obviously while you're growing up, you don't understand the world. And so, yeah, this was kind of him him walking a mile in someone else's shoes. And, I, and this movie's had a profound impact on Mexico, man. Like, you have no idea, like, uh, 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 people are really just everyone's talking about stories of about their nannies and stuff this uh wow. guy i work with Fareed, who's mexican like he fucking swears by this movie and had this you know was gushing about it and, and his nanny and stuff for a while like this movie's a huge deal there and it's it's, good. it's so awesome that it's gotten you know that it exists for one good for netflix and that uh yeah i hope it wins best picture it see the interesting thing is i kind of got the impression that in the family that Quaron was the youngest son that he was the one who was close, because he's the one who's like super clingy and lovey dovey with Cleo. I don't right? think he is. I think he's the other one. He's the oldest son. I, I or, think so. Three, I, I should know this, but I think he's not the youngest one. 
Oh, okay. See, I kind of, okay. So it's interesting because here's one of the things I noticed about the family. So this is one of the issues where I think, you know, the background, how it like affects, if you will, the actions of individuals. And so the question is, is like, how are you an individual in the background of your context that is structuring you? So like, there's the bit where the boy wants whatever it is, his like ice creams or his Twinkies or whatever the fuck he wants. Right. And he doesn't want to share. And I thought there was something really interesting about how the older kids didn't want to share, but the younger kids were much more inclined to share. And I thought that that kind of, to me, it indicated that as you get older, you become more sort of um, inculcated into the system of which you're a part, right? A system of competition and a system that isn't about sharing, but especially in the background of this film being about land expropriation in this class struggle between people who are fighting for egalitarianism and then those who are fighting more for like the privatization of land and of resources. And so what you get then is how that affects the family division, how the, the older you get, you become like the father and you become selfish and you become less concerned about community and you become less concerned about preserving that sort of more uh, egalitarian mindset and you become more individual and focused on your own things, right? Not that having individual desires is a bad thing. Of course, that's not what I'm saying. But the point is, is that there's an extreme to which an individual pursuit can become a negative thing because it can detrimentally affect other people around you. And I thought that was something that was really interesting. And so what I was wondering was, was Quran, the young kid, and he was kind of almost like this is like his criticism of the system as he's now looking back on it. And, and and maybe it's even more interesting now if he's not the young one because then it's almost like a self criticism where he's saying, "Wow, I realize how how that system even affects me." And now this is like Ryan just said, not like it, it's not like an apology, but this is kind of like a he's trying to even the scales of justice almost by saying, "Hey, I'm working through this." I have no idea which child he is, but I like Ryan's reading, and it kind of is ties into my pure guess of a reading about the plane being his kind of guilt of leaving that it could also just be like perhaps wishing that he had done things differently or saw the world through a more mature lens when he was a kid or something like that um yeah but before we go on i want to tell you guys that this episode is also brought to you by movie we got movie back guys they yeah. are a curated streaming service showing Woo exceptional films from around the gro globe so let me tell you how you guys let me tell you guys how this works every day movie will premiere a new film it'll either be a foreign film a timeless classic or an acclaimed masterpiece uh, there's always 30 different films to discover but uh, after 30 days that film disappears so you only have 30 days to watch it and then it's gone but there will always be 30 pretty awesome curated films to watch so right now they're doing a whole thing uh, called the uh, I think it's the Sundance Spotlight and the movie that I recommend from the Sundance Spotlight is, and I think Ryan probably has something to say about this movie, is the uh, 90s film by Vincent Gallo, Buffalo 66. Oh, I, yes. Oh, classic. Yeah, I really, really like this movie. Um, you know, Vincent Gallo's only made two movies. He's a notoriously Hollywood crazy person. For those of you who have seen Entourage, he is the character Billy is based off of because he's basically <laughs> a... Um, Kind of a egomaniac, but Buffalo 66, man, is so good. And uh, you can watch it right now on Mubi. You can try Mubi for 30 days at Mubi.com slash Wisecrack. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash Wisecrack for a whole month of great cinema for free. Check out Buffalo 66. I'd love to do that movie for the podcast. That movie is fucking ace. You know, it's funny because the, 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 talk about a singular vision for a film. Like that movie, there's nothing else like that movie. There is nothing I, else I like that I can think of, you know, like... Uh, yeah, there's a lot in common. And to talk about a, a very uh, a very personal vision, because uh, Vincent Gallo, right. didn't he grow up in Buffalo? I don't know about that. Oh, I don't know. It seems Maybe like a not. very personal film. Well, anyway. All right, and back <laughs> to the show, guys. All right. And we'll see you at the movies. Of course. How could I forget about that? <laughs> I, Ryan, I hope you're getting checks for from them to uh, to come a, up with that a, trademark. I get a ten dollar bill and an in and out gift card every time I say it. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so let's talk a little bit more about some formal elements going on in this movie. So Ryan already alluded to this, but there's a lot of stationary panning shots. The camera tends to stay stationary and pan, which is basically just going from left to right rather than laying laying down tracks and having the camera move. Just from a practical standpoint, I'm going to go ahead and venture a guess that 
Quaron wanted to shoot in a real house. He didn't want to build a set. He didn't want to build a house that has like a wall that collapses so he could make the camera move more cinematically. He wanted to have a real domestic setting. So that's probably why he, you know, on, on one level, why he just let the camera pan rather than move. The only times you really see the camera move is when Cleo is walking through the streets of Mexico, when the forest is burning, and when Cleo is going into the ocean to save the kids. There might be a couple more. I didn't rewatch the movie, but I wrote down those couple times when it is on a tra- mm. it is on a track and the camera's moving with the subject. Hmm. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Is there- Do you think that there's something? thematic or conceptual that is accompanying those moments or do you think it's just because of the limitations of like the the real domestic setting that he's thrown into oh absolutely i mean he wants to lock it off and like like it's a slow movie and that but then those are the kind of big beats you know that the, i love that fire scene. oh yeah that scene was amazing and then the the guy singing the the lullaby uh, uh while the fire the place burns you know and the whole town is putting it out i mm. to be honest while i was watching it the first time i'm like i don't know i'm sure this means something more than just you know like it, it's you know the, the whole like we were saying before the whole background isn't really being uh, uh said um but uh and why are we watching this scene but it was it was poetic and then the fucking beach scene mm. i mean everyone loses their shit on that like you said you can't fucking breathe and so obviously uh, uh he wanted to uh uh you know, let the camera a little loose for that scene. Yeah, during during that lullaby scene, I got super emotional. Gosh, it's, it's I don't, for effect, there a couple, is basically there, what I'm saying. It is right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like. Yeah, there, there, that's clearly that's one of the effects that it has. Like, if if the camera is so static all the time, but then all of a sudden you go to handheld, or if you go to like a tracking shot, obviously it's not handheld here, but you go to a tracking shot or something like that, um, then then it does it changes the pace so like our experience of it becomes almost more frantic right if if everything is slow before maybe that's why the the birth scene and the beach scene at the end are so intense compared to the rest is because we've been lulled into a sense of almost like calm in at least our aesthetic uh, digestion of what's before us and then all of a sudden it's like pace pace and that sort of disrupts us and it affects us in in a different way you know, and I actually have another uh, uh, or guess on why this is, too. That's a, also a very practical reason. Like, I don't know if you know how this movie was shot, but this is another reason that Quan is a fucking master, because not only does he know how to edit a film, shoot a film, but, uh, you know, direct a film, but he – but, yeah, directing actors – on this movie, the way he did it was that he, we wouldn't tell, no one knew really the story going in like anybody. Uh, they would, they would basically go into a scene and then he would tell them kind of about what they were doing during that scene. And there was, uh, uh, and yeah, so every scene was, was chronologically shot and piece by piece. So I think that, you know, having a locked off camera, you can't be having just, if people don't know really what's going on until the day, you can't really be ha- doing all these crazy moves. You want to just lock off the right. camera also because, you know, it's a slice of life movie. So it's slow, like we said. And then, yeah, just let these, these pretty new actors act. There's only one real actor in the movie. It's the mom. And, you know, all these other mm. people are just regular people that uh, a famous film director has got into a house with 65 millimeter film to shoot a, a movie. And, and this is how it turned out. It turned, you know, it, it feels so real, you know, yeah, it just feels real. It's awesome. Mm. Yeah. I got nothing better than that. You know, one thing I forgot to mention, and I don't want to dwell on this for too long, but I mentioned deep focus. The one scene that has selective focus is the baby scene. And now I don't know if that's for any yeah. profound reason or just for reasons of decency because I don't so, want that process of trying to resuscitate the baby in focus. It's a, it's hard enough to watch as it is. Yeah, it's interesting, tough, man. It really got me. Yeah. Um, I, and honestly, yeah. the, 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 scene that, the, the scene that got me the most is uh, uh, which that seems a big part of is obviously the one that's supposed to get you the most is when they're on the beach hugging. And then she's like, I didn't want her. I didn't want them. You know, I really, I, I literally cried at oh. that moment. I never cry ever. Only Coco has made me cry in the last decade. Something about <laughs> movies about Mexican culture. Just make you cry. <laughs> I, hear, I hadn't thought I hadn't put that together, but yeah, you're right. <laughs> 
Um, oh, man. All right. So moving on, let's talk about the car and Cleo's confession. So I really liked the parts with the car. Something something that really speaks to Quaron's mastery, I think, is the fact that every time the car would come into the driveway and Antonio is just you know, putting it in park, putting it in reverse, putting it in drive. I was like, ooh, ooh, like, don't fuck up the car. Even when she's driving <laughs> on the road and she gets stuck between those two cars, I could, I was just like, oh, God, I feel your pain. Um, so there's, like, a whole progression that happens here. Antonio drives the car into the driveway very carefully with some classical music playing in the background, and I thought that part was just awesome. There was something very mm. balletic about him trying to get the car into the driveway with that classical music playing. Uh, so then mm. Sophia gets the car stuck between two other cars on the road, scratching it up horribly. Uh, then while dealing with her husband's infidelity, she crashes the car multiple times going to the parking mm -hmm. spot like she doesn't give a fuck. And then at the end, she decides to get a new, smaller car that has no problem getting in and out of the driveway. So what do you guys think the car represents? What, uh, represents like um, yeah. I mean, I, I have a feel. I have a hard time believing that this is just a gag, especially when. Kind oh, of I don't think it's a gag at all. I mean, uh, 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 you know, when your dad comes home, like that's just a. a I remember that being a big deal, and then you know, this is just a very vivid memory, is what I got from this person. From I don't know. I I, I, I I couldn't tell you honestly what it represents other than just a dad coming home and uh, vivid details. So, well, but the I'm car, not, no, I mean, he's, not, he's not the only one that drives it. I'm just saying there's a yeah. car. It's too big for the house. It keeps getting scratched yes. up. And then they said, you know what? We don't need that car. Let's get a smaller one because we don't need the big one. And it fits much more. It fits much better with our current situation. You know, so I hadn't thought I, about I that, but yeah, you're right. Being, being grateful I mean, I for what you got and downsizing. Yeah, living within your means, so to speak. But so I, I come from a family that uh, my father is like when we park in a parking park as far away on the end spot and he will inch over as far as possible away from the next spot so that nobody parks next to him and potentially dings his door. Like if there's nobody else in the parking lot, he will still do that. Because he wants to preempt someone put parking next to them. Or he carries one of those duster things, the car, and then he will get out sometimes and dust off the car after he parks it, right? Like, my father is a. That sounds a like a real Southern Californian. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the funny thing is, he's a construction worker who drives a big pickup truck, too. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, awesome. but, you know, I mean, obviously, he and my stepmom, like, it, it's a. Her car that he usually still takes very it's still the same way with his car though so his truck too he's always been that way and it's because he takes pride in his personal property and he takes very good care of his things he's never the type to just throw something in the corner if he, he doesn't want something to just like get dinged up his iphone is always set gently down on the table like he takes very good meticulous care of things part of it's good in type a but i think another part of it is because he was raised by a military family and they were, were kind of the same kinds had to be a certain length and it was this this middle class vision of you have your house and you take care of your things because you earned them and you take pride in them and you've invested yourself into your objects because they are a symbol of you and i think that's kind of what this car is is he takes care of it because it's a symbol of his success it's a symbol of his wealth of his status and of who who he is so if the car doesn't fit comfortably in the garage he will inconvenience himself pull in the mirrors, drive incredibly slowly, take an extra three times the amount of time in order to park the car so that he can still have this thing and live this image. Southern Orange County, where I'm from, the car thing especially affects me, and I don't know if it has the same context in 1970s Mexico, but the car is almost more important than your house. Like, you can live in an apartment, you drive a 7 Series BMW, because that's what you're in most of the time because it's a commuter city and that's what you're showing off to the public as you're driving down the street. 
So that might have something to do with this. And then at the end, when the mother gets a smaller car, she's like, fuck it, we don't need to live up to those standards anymore. Let's just be practical and be realistic here. And so there's something kind of going on there with that tension between the father's desires and then what the mother and and maybe even kind of like a gender thing of what's going on there in, in, in this particular context anyway, of like a sort of masculine need to show off wealth and then a sort of like more feminine need to be practical and just be like, fuck it, we don't need to live up to that standard at the moment, you know? So the way I think that was a great breakdown of the car, Austin. Well, the way I no, well, thank you. Well, the way I read it is how perhaps, and and I'm not married to this at all. I think also what what Austin put forth is interesting. So the car represents how their marriage between Antonio and Sophia was just a pain in the ass that required too much work to just get through without fucking shit up. So, and then things get better when you kind of just let go, you know. Because at the end, Sophia realizes that she's better off without Antonio. Mm. Why kill yourself over trying to maintain this marriage that it's just the passion isn't there? He'd rather be off with someone else. So just downsize your life. Because at the end of the movie, she's very content. Both of them are. Both Sophia and Cleo are pretty content. Cleo has the epiphany that she didn't want the child after all. And she tells her friend at the end that she had a great time at the beach and she seems really happy with her family. And Sophia realizes that it's going to be a change without Antonio, but she's happy to be with her family. And everyone's pretty upbeat by the end when they're back in their house and they have all these books without bookshelves. So I kind of... Now, now, wait a minute. I, I don't think that she's happy that she doesn't have the baby, though. Uh, uh, at the end, I if I said that, I mean, she, well, she says she didn't want the child. I'm not saying that Cleo's no, happy. I'm I, not. I'm not saying that she's happy that she doesn't have the baby. I'm saying she's happy that she had a great time at the beach and she seems to really love the family that she works with. Or well, works and for. she just and that was a, that was they all it went through like a basically the equivalent of a car crash in the ocean together. You know, they they hmm. with the 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 life threatening scene. Uh, so yeah, that that was kind of. To me, the big moment of contentment at the end was that she real in that moment of her saving those kids, she really kind of everyone saw what was true and meaningful in life and uh, uh, and that they had each other there. And uh, no matter what their class relationship was, even though that affects their lives. And then, yeah, she w couldn't wait to tell her all about this crazy adventure she had at the beach. But to me, the big confession, you know, when she says that, like, like that was that that, her, so that was her projecting her her lost baby onto those kids that she takes care of. You know, she kind of was like, you know, I uh, to me it was her saying, I wish I had, but like, like I can't I can't believe I was I, I had said that I didn't want this kid because obviously I would want this kid if it was here. Oh, and, you know, I that's not so how I read it at all. That, I worked so hard to save mm. the, these kids right now in the ocean that aren't even mine. You know, like, uh, uh, how did you read it? I read it as she was able to admit to herself that she didn't want the baby, and then that was just a huge weight off her back. It was a big, a big release. Like Sophia has the weight off her back when she realizes, you know what, I can go on without Antonio. Jesus, no, <laughs> I don't think that. That's... What What did you take, Austin? So I kind of thought that this was just an extension of that theme of displacement. And what it did is it affected her vitality and her ability to conceive life, right? And I think that what we experience in that final scene is a guilt. It's a guilt that – the guilt and it's a shame. And, and I don't think they're the same thing. I think the shame comes from something that is uncontrollable and that she feels responsible for. So I think that because she felt that it was her fault that she couldn't have the baby, I think there's a shame – but then I think there's a guilt because she also realizes that she didn't actually want the baby because she wasn't going to be able to give it a family. She wasn't going to be able to the, – the father wasn't in the picture. She feels that sense of displacement of not being up still kind of being in the family. And so at the end, what you see more than anything is this confluence of these emotions of I couldn't save my baby, but I could save you, and you are, are my family. I, I may be displaced in this world. I may have had my – culture ripped from me my, we find out, uh, out in the middle part of the movie that her mom's land is now going to be taken away too my identity is, is has been rent and torn asunder but nevertheless i can still try to salvage some sense of life in this world and that's what she does is she sacrifices herself for this family and even though she couldn't save her own baby she could save these other babies very cool all right, guys, we're going to go ahead and go into the mailbag. If you guys want to give us a call, it's 
Elf Gut or Elf Hut 07. So that's 213 534 8807. Uh, we got voicemails about the Fire Festival documentary that we did a podcast on. Let's start with this one. Go this one. Hello, Wise Track. This is Paresh calling from Taiwan. I just listened to your Fire Festival uh, documentary experimental podcast. I found it to be really, really great. But I had a, a small comment on how you talk, uh, how you talked about uh, receiving goalposts. Uh, I think that word really, truly summarizes the uh, Indian culture about how the life should be. So let me give you an example. When we are in school, we are supposed to be a good student so that we can pass 10th grade, what, what I call our board exams, uh, to get a good high school. Once you're in high school, you prepare for university. Once you're in university, you prepare for graduate school. Once you're in graduate, you prepare for jobs. Once you're in a job, you prepare for marriage. Once you're in marriage, you prepare for a baby. Once, you're, once you get a baby, the cycle moves on and it just goes on for the baby. So when, when I think it was Austin who mentioned receiving goalposts, it just hit me that everything old is new again. This uh, obsession with image that we have in Indian culture is just being perpetuated, supercharged on Instagram. The difference hmm. is before it was our parents doing it to us, and now it is uh, us doing it to ourselves. Uh, I don't know if it is true for the American culture as such, uh, because it is not as um, shame-based, I guess. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's my comment. I love your show, and I would just like to say that the documentary experiment was successful. Thanks. Bye-bye. Awesome. Thank you, Parish. Well, the one thing I would say is, you know, if you find yourself on Instagram and you're finding yourself filled with envy looking at stuff, you got to just remind yourself, this is all bullshit. This is all bullshit. <laughs> Somebody is curating a narrative that they want you to believe, that they are trying to trick you to believe, and it's honestly just healthier and more likely accurate if you just dismiss it as like, as just nonsense. That's my two cents. What do you guys think, Ryan? Um, yeah, I don't have much to say, but I pretty much agree with you. But I would say I wouldn't call it bullshit. I mean, what you're really saying is, you know. It, all Instagram is it's a it's a mirror being held up to the human soul, Jared. You know, so it's, uh, it's, you a, fun, like it's a fun it's a fun house then. mirror. It's a what? fun it's a fun house mirror. It's a fun like house that. mirror. All right, sure, yeah, I agree with that. All right, um, I I think that what he said real quick, uh, he said something that I think is so brilliant that I think we should we should the idea that the shame or that the the pressure to conform or the pressure to like uh, live up to those expectations has shifted from parents to something else. I think that's really mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. And because he said that it doesn't come with shame. And with the parents, they shame you, they guilt you into you have to get a job, you have to do this. But now that shame doesn't just come from a singular central authority that is like this top down authority, but it becomes embedded into everything that we do. And so uh, Herbert Marcuse, the critical theorist, refers to this as repressive desublimation. It's a, it's a very technical term, but it basically just means these things that previously existed kind of uh, outside of us that we sort of sublimated into our cultures have become repressed and they sort of are embedded imminently in just the things that we assume and we're not even aware that they're pressuring us because they don't impose the same guilt upon us but they work now by other incentives and instagram is just the way that it incentivizes us is by promising us satisfaction so it operates without the negative that comes with a shame culture or a guilt culture and instead it operates by a positivity culture that this will give you pleasure and so it's similar in that it's still kind of that receding goalpost effect is happening, but it's without the guilt mechanism attached to it because now you don't have to feel guilty for endlessly being dissatisfied. And that's a strange tension to deal with or a strange phenomenon to deal with. You know, when I think about these things and I was thinking about, you know, you know Ryan, what do you think? But honestly, Ryan, and I've said this to you before, I feel like you're immune to all of this. Like, Ryan is just like a Buddhist monk. He doesn't, like, you know, like, the images of success perpetuated put in front of him literally have no bearing on on his existence. Am I, am I yeah, right? fuck all that. Yeah, like, it just doesn't even, 
affect him even subconsciously, and I've always been very jealous of that. All right. Yeah. You can have this power too, Jared. I don't know if I can, man. I I don't know if I can. Anyway, uh, let's move on to the mailbag. You can send us an email at movies at wisecrack.co. This first one is from Joaquim. He says, I listened to the Con Air episode when the question if any actor like Nicolas Cage exists, my mind instantly traveled to Jack Nicholson and some of his extreme roles. In Batman, Mars Attacks, and The Shining, his facial expressions and didactic over-the-top speech patterns almost seem like a proto-Cage. Agree? Disagree? Would love to hear your thoughts. What do you guys think? Hmm. I I think, uh, I don't know. I mean, Jack Nicholson's a little more... Qual legit, I think, in his roles. I mean, uh, uh, the signing's probably his best example, but I there's not that many more. He's a li- he's a little off the chain, but still grounded. He's a, he's the everyman guy. Well, I definitely I mean, think I think what you're going you think, for. What about like John Malkovich? He has a strange speech pattern too, right? But he doesn't really do the facial expression. He kind of, yeah, he doesn't have. The I mean. Crazy- I don't know. Jack Nicholson yeah. gets bombastic, but he never straddles the line of like breaking the movie, like like Nicolas Cage does, you know, of going outside right, reality. Right. Like we believe that Jack Torrance is going crazy in The Shining. We believe that the Joker really is that insane. I haven't seen Mars Attacks in a long time, but I think that's kind of the distinction I would make is that Nicolas Cage basically will break convention with the other people in the movie and just do his own thing and that can kind of run the risk of almost seeming like it's breaking the film right well like in action circles yeah. we refer to it as the moment it's it's about being moment to moment and so uh like there's this technique for uh, that was invented by sandy meisner that's called uh, repetition is this game where you basically repeat what the other person is is giving to you but the point is is that you're paying attention and you're connected to what the other person is giving you you're not forcing something into the moment the difference would be that that nick cage i think when he's criticized for being bombastic it's not just that he's big and over the top and weird facial expressions it's how do they fit in the moment do they jar let's say the harmony to use a musical term do they jar the harmony of that scene is the chord somehow askew because he's a note that comes in that's just a little bit off he's a little bit out of tune and that's the difference is if you're watching something and the pitch just feels like someone comes in and they're like really forced or really robotic or really over the top or really cheesy or they have no soul in their eyes. Those are things that do they fit with the harmony or do they fit with the chord, let's say, of the moment. And if they don't, then that would be sort of like an out of tune performance. And I think that's the issue with Nick Cage. Sometimes he goes out of tune, so to speak. That's all you have to do. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, I love it. This next one is from Andrew. He said, I listened to your episode on fire yesterday. Then today I was listening to the Planet Money podcast, and they said the people who'd been in charge of promoting the fire Festival were some of, were some of the same people who'd pr- produced the Netflix documentary. So the whole movie is, in their words, ethically compromised. I'd like to hear how you feel this factor changes or reinforces the ideas you discussed in the show. So, yeah, I guess this is the uh, whole hashtag fuck fuck Jerry thing. I uh, first of all, I still think the movie is well paced and interesting and builds to a very good climax. I think all the filmmaking elements of it are still maintained. I still think that fuck Jerry's uh, I, I think that no matter how sketchy their inclusion was, that doesn't put any that doesn't make Billy any more innocent at all. I mean, he's still the nexus of all these problems. Uh, but other than that, yeah, they probably underplay their own complacency in it. And that's not cool. But other than that, it doesn't really change much of what we talked about. I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, so I I made this initial comment at the outset. And remember, Claire and I had just a little bit of like a she didn't quite buy it. And I didn't say this explicitly, but this was in the back of my mind. I knew that it was produced by the guys from Fuck Jerry. It Mm -hmm. is produced by Jerry Media. Um, The documentary is. And I rewatched the documentary this week with a friend of mine, and one of the things that I paid attention to was this issue explicitly. Because I mentioned it at the outset where I said I felt like this film was intended to provide cover or support for the people that have a class action lawsuit against Billy. And that's what it felt like to me. And I think the thing is, look, at every documentary comes from a perspective. You know, How to Make a Murderer. Remember after How to Make a Murderer, everyone was like, well, here's the thing. But then there were all these op-ed pieces and other like investigative pieces that were like, well, here's other stuff that you don't find out in the How to Make a Murder documentary because it's from a different perspective. So we have to realize that 
every documentary, every book, every podcast is going to come from some sort of biased perspective. And so clearly there is a bias within this documentary. That doesn't somehow mean that we shouldn't watch the documentary or it's a piece of shit, but we need to be sensitive and aware of it so that we can recognize what is this documentary trying to tell us and why might those reasons be. And I do think that there is a sense in which it is trying to somehow absolve fuck Jerry from any sort of complicity or culpability because they have a hundred million dollar class action lawsuit. I think that they're a part of, you know, so, or if they're not a part of that one, there's something else. They want to make sure that they're not culpable financially for the class action lawsuit or whatever. So there's some sense in which they're trying to distance themselves, but I just don't like how they make Billy out to be this evil manipulative genius and that he could just trick anybody in the room because he's this expert. He's the best salesman on the worst uh, on the world. And it's like, I don't buy that shit. Whenever someone talks that much about somebody glowingly, I'm kind of like, well, either then you just fucking drank the Kool-Aid or you're trying to sell something else in the, uh, in the opposite to try to build them up as like the pure evil. And you're somehow like this innocent victim. And I just don't buy that shit. Yeah. But I mean, all the defrauding investors and the wire fraud, I mean, I think it's the same thing, but that's all Billy. Like there's no way you can pin that on fuck Jerry and I'm not defending them. I mean, it sounds like their whole no. plan of trying to make sure that they don't sound culpable looks like that might've backfired. And of course they're that. They, yeah. I mean, fuck them. I'm, I'm with the well, fuck but the, them, but, but the issue is this, if, if it's incompetence or if it's fraud, that's a completely different legal framework. If they can prove that Billy defrauded people, he intentionally, this fire festival was some sort of fraudulent enterprise, that's completely different than them saying, well, hey, he was basically just trying to crowdfund a festival, but that ultimately he thought that if he could do this, that he was going to be able to make money on the, the next step and the next step and that the app would get launched and then he'd be a billionaire and then he'd be able to cover all of his debts. So there's a difference between like negligence or incompetence and fraud. And by them making it out to be fraud, they're making a completely different legal case. And I think I that's, a, that's what's at issue. I see. All right. I was not aware of that. Uh, that well, sounds legit. Well, you know, I, uh, Jared, I think I told you this, but I'm a fire, fi fire festival documentary completist. I've seen both of them. Oh, all of us and, have. Um, say what? All of us have. Um, me and Austin oh, watch yeah. both. Yeah. Right. But like, like I knew that going in and I actually thought that that was kind of a big part of it that I think it's kind of hilarious that 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 the the, the meta uh, commentary that that you have two documentaries coming out about this thing, the sketchy festival, and both of them have done sketchy things about their production. One's put on by the fucking sketchy group that put it on, and then one paid the other guy, uh, you know, the guy who put it on two hundred thousand dollars. This criminal, you know, for the most uh, worthless for, for interview ever. Say what? Yeah, for the most worthless interview ever. It was totally worthless. Right. It was stupid. But but it just it, it, to me that that's just kind of funny that 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 that, that happened uh, uh, behind the scenes. However, I would say that they're both kind of even handed. They both make I don't know the the, the, the Hulu one makes Buck Jerry. Uh, the, they don't look so innocent. I don't I don't feel like. No, the Hulu one definitely does not. They they silly. actually even call out the Netflix one for being produced by Jerry Media. Right. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. There's another one that people were commenting on uh, when we were doing the live chat. It's like Internet Historian. Is that the YouTube channel? Yeah. Is that? I haven't gotten uh, a chance he, to watch it yet, but apparently, yeah, his video was huge. Yeah, I watched it. I think it's got like 5 million views or something like that. I watched it. It's only like 10 minutes or something like that, but it's, it's really good. It's really good, and it kind of gives a little bit of information, like just like little details of people's experience on the island, like people getting sick, people getting into fights, Oof. stuff like that that the other documentaries don't yeah, really talk that. about, which I thought – which I thought was nice. It kind of just added in some some holes. So, and it's only like ten minutes, so people should check that out too. Cool. All right, this last one is from Logan. He says he's talking about Venom. He said there's a detail I noticed in a scene that you guys talked about. The one where Riz Ahmed's character makes a show out of using a little girl who asked a question to expound on some moral platitude. The point is, after Riz goes on this monologue about the importance of asking questions, he walks away, and neither he nor the audience hear the girl's question. This could be a nitpick and or a case of awkward mm. editing or writing, but because I'm going all death at the author on this movie's ass, which we appreciate, I think this <laughs> moment is an interesting example of the theme of paras parasitism that was discussed. Rather than waiting to even hear her question, Diet Elon Musk uses this girl, who happens to be of color, as a prop to further his image as this progressive ubermensch. In a way I find parasitic, he adopts the superficial image, 
But because he's a fuckboy who doesn't actually give a shit about the little girl's question, he's not able to achieve symbiosis between his public image and his real motivations. Overall, I think it's telling that this character cares more about his image as this magnanimous noble figure than he does about following through with the moral stance that he tries to champion. That sounds legit to me, Logan. I, you know, I re- a couple of people have brought that up. I don't think they put it as uh, well as you did, but I like that. And it's mm. if that was the case that, I mean, well, I'll go death of the author with you. Whether the writers intended it or not, I think the fact that it works kind of just adds into the equation of why I kind of strangely appreciate this movie. Hmm. You're saying it has more okay. depth than people have given it credit for? Um... I don't even know if I'm saying that. I am saying that uh, the movie is odd and fun and weirdly fun to think about. Is I get all I'm really saying. Because I don't what even think the theme is, of parasitism. Tom Hardy. I, well, I'm not even saying that either. I'm, I'm saying that <laughs> the theme of parasitism isn't even done like gracefully or subtly. But mm. you know, I'm glad it's there in a fun movie starring Tom Hardy, in which he goes kind of crazy, and. Uh, yeah. Yeah, if there's a sequel, I'm sure I'll see it. Of course, there's going to be a sequel. What am I nuts? I'm gonna say there's no depth, but I'm glad that this guy found a little bit in it. Good job. All right, guys. all right, all right, guys. We're gonna sign off. Ryan, where can we find you on the internet? Oh man, you can find me on Ryan Shorts and Ryan's Game Show on YouTube and Facebook. I have shit there every week. And I guess you can see me on Funhouse now, too. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to be on a, a GTA video in a couple of weeks. And he was uh, in one of their videos about the Super Bowl recently, and uh, I've got a collab coming up with them soon. So I'll be over at the office to harass you, Ryan, soon. Oh, hell yeah. I can't wait for that day. <laughs> All right, Austin. <laughs> where, can, where can they find you on the Internet? Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter, Austin underscore Hayden. You can hit me up on Instagram, A-U-S underscore H-A-Y. I do a philosophy podcast called Owls at Dawn. I do another film podcast called I Dig This Movie. We just did a little review on A Star is Born, and then uh, the episode, the main episode was on Teen Wolf. But we have a huge back catalog of shit. So we've been subtly going for two years, but, you know, I mean, I'm torn between my two movie podcast loves. I've got, you know, the show me that is in my heart and then i've got like my best friend Kier in london who has i guess we could say my loins so it's it's difficult you know yeah but I'm, I'm, i split my time between the two i'm uh, i'll definitely <laughs> i i like having your heart he can keep the loins um by the way next I week say we battle to the death <laughs> by the way next week ryan you're gonna be very happy to hear this next week we are covering the batshit insanely awesome movie tetsuo the iron man O M F G yes. Can't wait. <laughs> Hell yeah. Awesome. All right. So we'll see you next wait, week for well, We're uh, really doing that for the fourteen people who who know about that movie now? We're doing it this? next week. That's right. It's just, you know, fuck it. Fuck it. Awesome. All right, guys, signing off. You wanna give us from Hollywood, California, Ryan? Goodbye from Culver City, California. I'm sorry if my microphone didn't sound that good. (laughs) Peace, guys. Later.